brilliant. So welcome again to the third year of the Book Edit Writers' Prize, this year held in partnership with Legend Press and judged by the fantastic Deepa Anapara. We have lots of exciting news from our former prize winners, all of whom spoke of the confidence winning the prize inspired in them. And here are just a few of the things our former prize winners have been up to. Uh, 2021 winner, Malachi McIntosh, subsequently won the Royal Society of Literature's Giles St. Auburn Award for Nonfiction for his groundbreaking group biography of the Caribbean Artists Movement, which is due to be published by Faber and Faber in 2025. A Revolutionary Consciousness, Black Britain, Black Power and the Caribbean Artists Movement. And he's also published a short story collection, Parables, Fables and Nightmares with Emma Press, which came out this September. 2021 winner Hannah Hall had her winning novel, Parahumanity, published on the 19th of August 2022 by Wild Wolf Publishing. The book envisions, I can say that properly, a dystopian future where both science and religion have fallen into disrepute, following semi-feral 17-year-old Katerina as she uncovers the truth behind the spin. 2021 winner Mitch Moroni launched the literary magazine Swerve in Ireland last year. The magazine showcases emerging writers and artists from Cork, as well as works in translation, and it's really lovely. You can go and have a look at their website. Uh, 2022 winner Julia Rea subsequently signed with Juliet Pickering at Blake Friedman. And another 2022 winner, F.Q. Yo, signed with Katie Greenstreet at Paper Literary for her adult fiction and with Hannah Shepherd Literary Agency for her children's books. 2022 long-listed writer Hamish Majaria has since sold his thriller trilogy, The Harvey and Jill Mysteries, to Pan Macmillan in a preempt. And a 2023 shortlisted author this year had to bow out of the competition due to an imminent book deal. So news on that forthcoming. But as you can see, it's all very exciting. And our former winners have done some fantastic things. And we really hope that this year's winners, in fact, we know, will go on to do equally wonderful things in the years to come. And don't forget, this is your chance to snap them up. So before we hear from this year's winners, I just want to thank Emily Pedder for dreaming up the prize with her partner, Aidan Walker and for doing all the hard work behind the scenes. And thank you too to our partners at Legends Press, uh, Legend Press, who I know are, are here, which is lovely. I'd also like to thank Deepa Anapara, this year's judge. Um, she said of judging, it was a privilege and a pleasure to read the submissions for the Book Edit Writers' Prize. There was immense variety in style, genre and form, and I found each extract to be engaging, entertaining and immersive. My congratulations to the winners and everyone who submitted. I wish them all good luck with their writing. And she's certainly chosen some transformative writing. So prepare to dance your way through a medley of genres from YA through romance, fantasy, crime to literary fiction as we journey from Scotland through the north of England, London and Kent to Lebanon, Sudan, the Caribbean and Arizona. Navigating love, gunshots, gangs, wild maternal rebirths, and the pleasures of physical movement. So you've got a very exciting evening ahead of you. Lucky you and me. So uh, just to get things straight off, off to the, straight off, we've got Mariam Sheik. She is taking us into the 15-year-old mind of wannabe dancer Asha Gupta. You can read more about Mariam and her novel, I Dream of Strictly, in the chat, as will be the case for all of the writers to come. For now, please welcome Mariam. I dream of Strictly. So, I'm dressed in a shiny blue skater dress, waiting to audition. My hair is doing its own thing, and I'm sweating right down into my fishnet tights as I stand at the back of a queue of perfectly turned out preening girls in a dank corridor which smells of a weird combination of feet, bananas and chicken korma. I'm not sure what I'd expected a professional dance school to be like, but it wasn't this. Just like the flyer had said, the studios were above an Indian restaurant. Diva and I wouldn't have found it if it weren't for the metre-high model of an onion bargee stuck outside. She probably thought this was the audition for High School Musical, snorts one of the preening hopefuls in front of us. More like Monster High, says her friend. There are at least five girls in front of me with their prickly dance mums. Each girl is immaculately dressed in professional-looking practice wear. I suddenly feel very exposed. 
Will you stop doing this to yourself? Chides Diva as she spots me checking out the competition. Stop worrying. You don't need a snotty dance mum to big you up or fancy clothes. I've seen you dance every night practicing those moves from Strictly. How much more determined can you get? I'm stacked diva. These girls look like they've been dancing since they're about two. I spot a frail pale girl who looks as though she's about to faint. Her mum is standing like a prison warden next to her. I smile at her and she smiles back with a thin, desperate, get me out of here look. A young woman with a clipboard pops out of one of the dance studios. Her eyes scan down a list of names. You must be Melissa Rockfort. Her voice trails up, trails when she looks up and sees a chubby Indian girl. Oh, she mumbles, a note of shock in her voice. Asha Gupta, I say. The Bollywood classes are down the corridor. What? Just because I'm Asian means that Bollywood is my only option. My cheeks burn like molten lava. Did you register for the audition? I can't find your name. She makes a big show of running down the list with her pen. You also need to be with an adult. Her eyes cut to Diva's face and zoom in on her silver leggings. Panic. I feel sick. Not just mini sick, but projectile vomit sick. Diva calmly folds her arms and squares up to the woman. Actually, I'm her sister. She lies. I've got my university ID with me. Wait here, I'll check. She spins around and disappears somewhere. Look, Diva, I'm out of here. I make for the exit, but Diva grabs my arm. Stop worrying. You've prepared your routine. It's brilliant. I've seen it multiple times. And you want to be a dancer more than anything in the entire history of wanting things. The jive number that's on is winding up. I want to escape. And I seriously need the loo. Asha, you're on says the woman, now looking a bit more smiley. It feels like there's a giant hairdryer hovering over me as I stand in front of the two dance coaches who are sitting behind a table. Suddenly, I don't want to escape anymore. I'm Shelley and this is Leon, senior Latin dance coach, says the woman. Tell us why you want to join our Latin dance team. My mouth goes dry. Cause dancing means everything to me. God, this is so cringy. I feel like vomiting. It looks as though the senior coach wants to as well. Leon rolls his eyes and scribbles something on a pad. What makes you more special than any other than the other girls we've seen? Presses Leon. Nothing, I admit. Cause everyone is special in some way. But no one could be more dedicated to dance than me. Um, I've wanted to be a dancer my whole entire life. I've messed up. I just know I have. Leon looks bored, and I've given him yet another reason to cross me off his very long list. Why do you like dancing? asks Shelley with a kind smile. It makes me feel alive. Leon raises his eyebrows and sighs as if blowing an invisible bubble. Begin. A cha-cha-cha number comes on, and my body starts to move, but not necessarily in time with the music. I do a few wobbly double turns. Then I propel myself across the floor with my signature crossover flicks move. Like a professional, I curve my spine into an S shape and fling an arm up for a few New Yorks, followed by some twirly hip twists. The music stops. Have you actually got any dance experience, snaps Leon. Sort of, I reply uncomfortably. I have if you include the time I danced with a boy in our year six rendition of West Side Story. He fell on top of me during a double turn and farted in my face, but Leon doesn't need to know that. Your arm styling was really quite messy and your timing was off, but your footwork was unique and your presence on the floor was bewitching, cut in Shelley. At least she's still smiling. Wait in the corridor, please. You were awesome, Diva squeals, hugging me tightly. You reckon? I asked doubtfully. After a million le years, Leon and Shelley step into the corridor. Total silence descends. We've now made a decision, says Leon. Chantal Richards, congratulations. The pale, frail girl's mum prods her in the back. I clap enthusiastically for her, 
but my heart just fell off the side of a mountain. Shelley is beaming at me, her smile as wide as a horizon. And Asha Gupta, thank you for reminding us of the magic of dance. The end. Thank you so much, Marin. I, I don't know about the rest of you, but um, yeah, I feel completely um, that the magic of dance has been so beautifully evoked. And I can't wait to find out what happens to Asha next. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. We are going to go further back through early childhood now with our next piece from Emily Abdini Holman, set in Lebanon of the 1960s. So please welcome Emily as she reads from her novel, Taffa. Thanks, Emily. Hi, everyone. He is still a very young boy the first time he hears it. It could be he's heard it before. This is the first identification, the first time he's understood what it is he's hearing. It's on the street outside. If he can just, he drags the stool to the window, clambers up and cranes his neck right back to see through the glass, too high on the wall. It's dark outside. There's no light other than the stars, which are bright, vivid, dreaming, as they always are. But they cast no light or not enough, and he's not able to see more than movement, which might be his thoughts anyway. Impossible to tell. But he did hear the sound. It was loud enough to make him listen, intrude into his nighttime sleepiness and make him suddenly eager. Adventure, adventure, only it's fading a little now. And he'd like to hear someone's tread on the stairs, like to hear someone open the door and then discover him, say, Taffa, out of bed, what are you doing there? And he'd say brilliantly, looking. And they'd sigh or laugh or say something about how he's growing so fast and before you know it, and they'd trail off and swing him from the stool, one quick motion, strong and fast and adult, and tuck him up in bed, kiss his forehead. And when the door was shut again, he could get back out, go back to the stool under the window and know they'd know he was doing it. Whereas at the moment, there's no sound in the house. He's heard nothing since the gunshot, not a cry or sigh or door, not a car, though those are rare enough. Should he go down? Perhaps no one knows what has happened. It would be curious though, because it is, it is his brother who has told him, this is a sound to be alert to, Taffa. It was a time he hadn't noticed anything at all and his brother said, the loud bolt, like something exploding, didn't you hear it? And Taffa thought back over the last few moments and thought perhaps there had been something. He wasn't really sure, but he nodded at his brother anyway. And Boutros said, when you hear that, you put your head down. It's a gun, Taffer. You know what it is. You've seen Pascal with one. But this isn't a game, not like it is with Pascal. So if you hear it like that, head down. Got it? And Taffer said yes. Boutros loves to tell him what to do. Always a big brother. Something he takes so seriously, not like the brothers of other boys. It isn't showing off. Boutros is nine years older. That makes the difference. He wonders again if he should go downstairs. He can still see the darkness outside, darkness covered by stars when you raise your eyes. And if you do that, it becomes hard to make out darkness as anything other than black once you lower your eyes again. His dad told him so saying, it's amazing really how what you can see depends on what you've seen seconds, moments before. Light compels you and urges you to look at it. It's bright and dancing and happy. And so you never really give darkness a chance. He shakes his head, tries to see a bit more clearly. There is still nothing visible, still no sound, just the gunshot, then silence. Years later, when he tries to remember what his first memory was, it won't be this that comes to mind. Instead, he'll remember a happy feeling he had at Sunday lunches, all of them together. And he'll wonder which was the one that did come first, the happy feeling or the sound of the gunshot. Taffa. He heard nothing of it, not a sound, but his father is there. His father, a long, narrow shadow in the doorway, moving towards him. Dad, what are you doing? I'm looking. I heard the noise. The Was it a gun, Dad? Yes. 
His dad is kneeling beside him, next to the stool, so their heads are level. For a moment, Taffer readies himself to jump, to become taller than his father. What's it for, he asks. Skirmishes, you know, like little fights. They're getting serious more quickly than they should. Fights? Yes, fights. More than arguments, these. The body gets involved. It's less about talk, more about hurt. Taffer nods. But why here? His dad angles his neck towards the window. Coincidence, my love, just chance, which makes it all the more foolish and all the more frightening too. Why here indeed, of all places in Jamhur? Frightening? Well, look at you, out of bed, and the rest of us downstairs, heads down, straight to the floor, away from the windows, and you, I looked. You mustn't, Taffer. His dad stands up a half torso taller than Taffer on the stool. Gently, he draws the curtains. Even when I came up here, I crept. I kept my head down. It's serious, it's not a game, not a joke. Do you understand? You're a boy, yes, you're young, yes, but you've got to understand you're not immune. I'm sorry to tell you it, my dearest, you've got to know your best chance to be immune. It means safe, do you see? Your best chance is to put your head down and keep well back. Do you hear me? Keep away. When you hear something like that or see anything. But I didn't see anything, Dad. I tried. I was looking. There's nothing out there except maybe something moving. I couldn't tell. Should we look, Dad? His dad puts his hand on his shoulder, right at the curve of the neck, soothing him there, fingers warm. My boy, I'd love to think what you're saying is brave, but I only think it's foolish. We keep back. It happens outside our door, but we don't open it. Not a single centimetre especially not a house like this, unprotected beside the forest. If you're in the city, it's something else. You work with other people, you collaborate. You put your heads together and come up with a plan. Here you recognize it's bigger than you and you do one thing. What is it, Taffer? Head down. You betcha. His dad swings him off the stool, one quick motion, just as Taffer thought it would be, swings him across the room. But instead of plopping him onto bed, his father says, want to come down? Oh, yes, please. Well, I think it's one of those nights. Good to be together, isn't it? Yeah. Pascal is here. And Abu Tony. Not Tony, though. And Naeem, too. You don't mind? Of course not. Dad? Mm -hmm. Did you really all just drop down to the floor? Even Pascal? Even Boutros? Of course. My love, it's what you have to do. Give no thought to it. Gunshot, get down. Promise me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, it's such a nerve wracking uh, extract. And um, yeah, the, the, the beauty of that childlike energetic voice against the, the kind of horror of that moment is really beautifully and well evoked. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, we are going to journey much further north, but we are staying with the child's perspective as we head into the realms of fantasy next, when Stephanie Torrance is going to read from her novel, Butterfly Wings, for us. So please welcome Stephanie. Hi. The third time mum died, I was eight. We were staying at her flat because I used to go there on Saturdays to see her for a bit before her shift started at the pub across the road. I didn't really like her flat all that much. It was too cluttered. Old copies of National Enquirer strewn about and stained with rings of tea, coupled with empty fag packets crumpled on the dinner table. The clothes that needed ironed were always in a haphazard pile in the corner of the room with a basket of maybe actually ironed clothes precariously placed on top like the glittery star on a decaying Christmas tree. That iron had broken a couple of weeks ago, she said, when Gran dropped me off so she was saving the little coupons you got in the cigarette packets to get a new one. But, she said, it would be a little while off until she got the one that she wanted because the ratio of coupon to fag was not in favour of the consumer. Mum had a particularly bad habit of breaking stuff. The tumble dryer had also gone earlier that day, so she decided to try microwaving her shirt dry for work. I think about that decision and what happened afterwards quite a lot since, and I still don't know what the fuck she was thinking. 
Mum's brain, I don't really think works like other brains. Anyway, so I was through in the living room having a drink of some strawberry milkshake, which may or may not have been a half drunk can of mum slim past and watching an old rerun of Morecambe and Wise when I heard this huge bang. I went through to the kitchen and there she was lying clean on her back and dead on the floor. The microwave door had exploded off its hinges. The shirt she was attempting to dry was on fire beside her with all of the buttons missing. Those along with bits of glass from the microwave plate and door were wedged into her face like these tiny melted bullets. The force from hitting her head against the door had um, cracked the back of her skull and a halo of blood was beginning to surround her. Her eyes were clear and open like a porcelain doll and if it wasn't for all the blood, she would have looked a bit like Snow White waiting for a kiss to be woken up. At that time, my mum's phone only accepted incoming calls because she'd run up this huge phone bill calling the psychic hotline that my gran had refused to bail her out on. So I just sat there in the hallway on my jacket and faced away from mum's staring pockmarked face. I slowly drank the remains of my strawberry milkshake the sickly, gummy, claggy liquid sliding down my throat until Gran showed up, as she always did, at seven. Oh, come on to fuck, Val, Gran growled, dragging Mum by her feet into the hallway. You're scared in the bloody barren. I don't think I was scared, though. This was the second time I'd seen her like this, and at least this time her head was still attached to her body. The last time was way more brutal. Bits of Mum had splattered across the pavement, and we weren't sure how she was going to change after that one. Gran's movement of the body had caused a thick strip of blood from Mum's cracked skull to slide through the flat like a shiny, sticky red carpet, like a glossy red version of the River Thames in the East Enders opening credits. Finally, she stopped in the living room and stuck a couple of old grain towels under her head while she decided what to do next. Eventually, Gran turned to me as I was standing in the doorway, slim fast can still in my hand, and she looked at me with pity. I can't carry her down the stairs right now, love. We'll just need to sleep here in this shithole, just until, you know, she's a little bit smaller. I nodded, took a big breath and entered the room. The thought of her body was always a lot worse than what it actually looked like. I had to remind myself of that. I had to remind myself that she wouldn't look like this for long, that she was coming back. Gran and I spent the rest of the night watching crap TV in silence. While I say TV, I spent most of it watching Mum's body for any sign of her changing. I'd never seen it before. Last time was like Christmas. I went to bed while she was a decapitated corpse, and when I woke up, she was shiny and brand new again. I wanted to know how it happens. Just before bed, Gran moved her again, this time to the corner of the living room behind the dining table, hidden away, a final resting place until morning. I fell asleep that night, quickly and deeply. I dreamt of mum's face, the blood congealing like tears from her bullet wounds. And then in the morning, when I woke up, there was the most intense pain screaming that I'd ever heard. I had slept in mum's big double bed all night by myself. and I didn't even know a bed could be so big. So I rolled out like a sausage out of one side and came through to see Gran in the living room, furiously trying to shush a naked baby in her arms. Honestly, Sophie, your mum is the worst. She manages to kill herself in this shit tip with no food. I tried to tell Gran that there was some slim fast in the fridge, actually. It tasted quite nice. But soon I was left with mum crying on one side of the sofa and I was to watch her as Gran nipped to the corner shop. Uh, thank you so much, Stephanie. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm sure you'll agree that you just really want to see what that transformation is like. And I'm sure you've read what what's in uh, what was in the chat, but just this idea of kind of seeing what these magical near human creatures with feathers. I mean, I, yeah, I just really want to read that. So thanks, Stephanie. Um, but before I can do that, we're jumping into a romance thriller with a twist as Pavan Amara is going to read from her novel, Mirror, Mirror, and you can find out more about that in the chat. So for now, please welcome Pavan. My name is, I was born to it, like it or not. Some people tell me it's a good thing. The ones who say that tend to be called Jenny or Sarah or something. Most of the time it's a problem. My name is Sandeep Thaliwal. Don't close the book. You can just call me Sandy like my girlfriend does. Her name is Victoria. 
I met her in a pub on a Thursday night while I was completing a word search in the corner. She was drunk and thought I had a lesbian vibe. I didn't confirm or deny it. I just kept sipping my Guinness and filling letters into squares. I let her carry on talking at me <clears throat> because she looked like Scarlett Johansson. She asked my name. Sandeep, I said. When I said that, she began chewing her bottom lip, but not in a sexy way. Sand deep, she said. Like a dune or something. Well, no, Sandeep, like one word. Can I go with Sandy? Yes, I said. It's one letter short of my real name. If Sandeep doesn't work for you, imagine it's Sandy, but with a silent P at the end. First dates. Before Victoria, I dated men, friends who turned into more. There was Matthew Lung with perfect skin and the type of sculpt sculpted cheekbones that you could hang washing off. I felt about him like dog owners must about their fluffed up Pomeranians. He was cute and all the other girls wanted one, so I kept Matthew for a bit. Then came Mirage Shah, six feet tall with a topless selfie as his iPhone screensaver. Sexually, he did something for me. I experienced a glimmer of straightness with Mirage. After a year or so, it had fizzled out. We became best friends who watched box sets together. My last boyfriend was Dwayne Mason, a plumber. He did all the right things, called at night, texted me during the day and bought flowers. One day, Dwayne stopped texting. I knew I should be upset, but I wasn't. These men didn't repulse me, but they didn't blow up my world. We'd have sex and I'd fantasize about women. I thought all women did that, maybe because my first crush was Pamela Anderson and I assumed every other girl had a crush on her too. I knew the rules, don't talk about it. Pretend you have a crush on Ronan Keating instead. I didn't think I was anything gay. I was this, I slept with women in my head and dated men in real life. I was 26, a straight woman. I'd never loved anyone until the perfect woman, someone who looked like Scarlett Johansson, dropped out of my head and into real life. After meeting Victoria, I wrote a list in my phone's notes app. It said, lesbian, bisexual, pansexual, hypersexual, asexual, sexual fluidity. I found all these words through Google. I deleted asexual, then hypersexual, then I got stuck. Lesbian, bisexual, pansexual, sexual fluidity. Day to day, all that mattered was that Victoria wanted me. I wore my clothes for her, something tight. I did my hair for her, a high sleek ponytail. Before her, I was about sweatshirts, jeans, hair loose and half combed. After meeting her, I bought a book about wine and practiced at home. A fruity, jammy type, I told the bathroom mirror. Buttery flavors racing to the surface with this one. I wanted to be the woman she desired without a day off. Art parties. She was a lawyer in Mayfair and her parents were the partners at her firm. We went to the Tate Art Gallery on the weekends because she was a member. Sometimes she took me to the Fulham Road art parties that her friends threw. I stayed quiet at these, nodding, while very thin people talked about their feelings towards paintings. Victoria knew all that stuff. That's not how you serve this wine, she'd tell waiters. It's corked. They'd listen and apologize. After a few glasses of Malbec, the same thing always happened. She'd start flaring to her art friends about how her mum was born in a council house. My granddad was born in a Liverpool tenement, she would tell them. I'm a working class girl at heart. One night she added this. I think that's why me and Sandy connect. I understand working class women. I'm even learning to speak Urdu. She didn't mean it, I told myself. In the cab home, she was breathing all over my face with what's wrong, baby. She lunged to kiss me. Why did you say all that stuff? I said. She joked back. What? About Urdu. Wrong language anyway, but that doesn't make me work in class. Darling, she said, spilling a long leg over mine. It's okay. I get your background. I had an aunt who didn't go to university. I went to university, Victoria, I said. I'm a midwife. I didn't fall for her when we first met. She looked good, but stomped around and talked too loudly for my liking. 
I found some things about her bizarre. I once took her to McDonald's and she asked for the menu. She could afford new clothes, but liked buying secondhand ones. She told people that she rented the flat that her parents had bought her. After a few months, I got to know other things. Her Sudoku obsession. It matched my love of word searches. She collected teapots. I had an extensive loose leaf tea collection and accompanying array of infusion accessories. Some of her teapots had cupcakes or London buses stamped on and she showcased them around her kitchen, balancing them precariously on top of cookery books and mantelpieces. She's a one-off, I remember thinking. Victoria had a big laugh and a gap between her two front teeth. When she got drunk, she'd shove a 50p coin in there and smile at me. Hello, she would say, with a coin jammed in her face. That's how it started. I began to imagine her with silver hair, still talking at me, my hands holding her liver-spotted ones. I was always a bit all or nothing. Thank you so much, Pavan. And yeah, totally. Isn't isn't she a, a one-off indeed? But then so is Sandeep. Uh, and you, I think you'll see in, in the chat, lots of people have really responded to that wonderfully strong voice that she has. And um, thank you so much for, for giving us all a good, a good giggle. Uh, and we can't wait to find out what happens next. Uh, we are going to go somewhere very different now. We're heading to Guyana as Claire Ramsaran reads from her novel, Carla Polari. So please welcome Claire. Thank you. Where are you going, Edward, at this time of night? Eddie's mother had spotted him heading towards the front door. Off to meet some of the others at Party HQ. You not had enough of your comrades this week, boy. Eddie ignored his older brother, trying to get a rise out of him as usual. He rubbed a glob of grill cream between his hands and smoothed it through his hair as he met his own eyes in the mirror. Checking your hair now. Are you sure it's your comrade you're meeting and not some girl? Vikram just wouldn't let it drop. I'll see you later. Eddie shut the door behind him and ran down the steps into the humid evening air and the chirping of cicadas. It was dark tonight, with barely a fingernail of moon above him. He crossed the parade ground, its boundary marked by a tall line of palm trees, each one alone, at a uniform distance from the next. As Eddie approached the rum shop, the door opened. He heard men's laughter and the clack of dominoes when a group of customers emerged. He studied them, looking for anyone he knew. His brother's handsome friend Lou was a regular here. Eddie had always looked up to Lou when they were boys. And as he got older, he tried to turn his mind away from the sinful thoughts he'd started having about his brother's friend. But as for Lou, he barely noticed Eddie. There were no familiar faces in the group of boisterous young men. Eddie didn't want to be recognized tonight. Anything he did could get back to his family so easily. He took a quick detour via Party HQ on Charlotte Street, best to keep as close to the truth as possible, less chance of being found out. The lights were still on. Looks like a couple of his comrades were working late, but not Eddie, not tonight. His country was important to him, independence and all that. Of course it was but sometimes he had other priorities. He remembered listening keenly to the gossip about the docks when he was a schoolboy. At the time he was intrigued, but wasn't exactly sure what the older boys were talking about. Then there had been the banter amongst the others on his cricket team as they unbuckled their shin pads after a match. Georgetown docks was where the pansies went to meet sailors spilling out of the visiting ships. The men joked and teased each other. Raj, you never married. Maybe you want to go down to the docks and find yourself a stevedore. But in between the banter, a couple of the midfielders described exactly what they do to those pansies if they ever met one. Eddie kept his mouth shut, but it set him thinking. There were other men like him after all. And apparently 
Georgetown Docks was the place they went to meet. The first time he visited, he was terrified. In fact, he'd lost his nerve and turned back a couple of times before he finally made it. That night, an older man had approached him and Eddie just followed his lead. He never even knew the man's name. They barely spoke. But Eddie remembered the scent of good strong sweat which surrounded them and something else, something spicy and acrid that he'd never noticed on other men in his cricket team after a match. By the end of Eddie's second visit, he'd begun to observe a choreography to the way the men moved in and out of the shadows. Even in this illicit game, it seemed there were unwritten rules. Tonight was his third visit to the docks. He was nervous, but excited. As he neared the Atlantic, Eddie was met with the familiar smell of seaweed, and soon the shape of the red and white striped lighthouse came into view. He stopped by the sea wall for a cigarette and to calm his nerves. Eddie's short sleeved shirt jack stuck to his back, partly due to the warm night, but also from the anticipation of the evening ahead of him. He only went to the docks when he couldn't help himself. He wasn't proud of what he did there with other men, the groping in hidden corners, the fear and shame, wordless if not soundless. It wasn't too late to turn back, but now he wasn't sure which would be worse, carrying on or slinking back home. Stubbing out his cigarette, he continued by the ocean, skirting the custom house to make his way into the docks. The water slapped rhythmically against the hulls of the foreign vessels. Unlike last time, the bulk of a British troop ship loomed over him, tethered to its moorings by clanking chains. His skin grew cooler now as he walked alongside the hulking flank of the ship, vast and grey, more like a building than a boat. The British had brought their troops over to teach the colonials a lesson. Well, they'd see about that. When he reached the usual spot, he could sense rather than see the others around him. He slipped into a dark corner, waited and watched. His heart thumped in his chest, his desire grappling with his fear. Within a few minutes, there was a slight movement in front of him. A figure emerged from the shadows, another stranger, nervous as a stray dog. Eddie could see him trembling. Maybe it was his first time here. The shape of the man's head, the way he held his shoulders, reminded Eddie of Lou. He had studied Lou's features so often. He had even made sketches of Lou's face from memory. This man had the same high cheekbones and small ears, his afro hair cut closely to his shapely skull. Just like Lou's. But it couldn't be, could it? Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire. I do, aren't, aren't we all desperately hoping it is Lou? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much for sharing that really atmospheric um, description of, of him walking there and the, the, the ship like a building. Uh, it's wonderful. I'm totally hooked. Um, but we're going to move on now uh, back to the north of England and a YA novel whose protagonist, Eddie, is about to tell us a very dark tale. So please welcome Nathaniel Wheatcroft Brown as he reads from his novel, You Look Better in the Sun. Thank you. Thanks. Part one, Before the Sun Rises. Chapter one, shadows curtain the streets. Fog crept below the thin necks of street lamps their pale orange heads unable to stare out the dark surrounding them. Their eyes would be better off shut, I thought, turned away. Light had no home here. We made our way north, moving through ginnels and shoulder-tight snickets. This was my first night with the lads. Darren had said I needed to join them, said I needed to, needed to start hanging around with the right mates, get me a head start in life. You ain't a pussy, are you? Wayne came up beside me and put his arm around my neck. 
He stank of cigarettes. His body was strong, almost like an adult's. He won't do shit, Jord spat. Darren just bent for him, ain't he? Jord was 13, my age. He never liked me. He was always doing some crazy shit at school before he got kicked out. Piss off, Jay, Darren said. He a sound lad. All I'm saying is he better not be a pussy. Wayne tightened his grip around my neck. I couldn't breathe right. You have a box before, mate? I shook my head. I'm telling you, he wouldn't do shit, George said. He wore a proper fairy at school. Fairy, were you? A weight smashed into the back of my head. I stumbled forward, barely keeping my balance as the street rang out in front of me. Hey, leave off. Darren pulled Wayne back, grappling onto my coat. You all right? Can't even take a slap. Wayne laughed. He gonna get his head kicked in if he a pussy. Nah, he all right. You speaking for him now and all. We turned into a park. Suddenly my feet were boulders, my legs slabs of iron. I didn't want to move, didn't want to go in there. I saw faces pained and hollowed out in the trees, their black eyes pleading me not to enter, not to go forward into what would become the darkest moment of my known life. I ain't a pussy, I said, looking down from the faces. Next guy we see, Wayne spat out a rocket of phlegm near my feet. You know what we do, yeah? I pulled the hood of my coat over my head and muttered, yeah. The wind warped and groaned through the bodies of the trees, possessing them, stabbing their limbs across the moon's light. Darren, I whispered as Wayne and Jord advanced a few feet ahead of us. Darren, I whispered again. I don't want to... Something hard gripped onto the back of my neck. Shut up, man. Darren's voice fumed into my ear. He ain't joking, you know. He was out here with us tonight. You gotta do what we do. What if I run? I said. Darren, what if I just run? I don't. Listen. You even think about it, then you're done. You think the lads ain't gonna know where you live if you start acting up? What, you a pussy now? I jerked away from his hand. They see you out again, then you're going to get the fucking shit kicked out of you. Darren hooked his arm around my neck. I hated that. It made me feel powerless. I gritted my teeth, flung his arm back. Get off, I grunted. But I was too loud. Wayne turned sharply on his feet, stepped forward. What that? We got Billy Big Balls over here all of a sudden. Now his arm was around my neck instead. Nobby no balls more like. George goaded. Don't need balls when you take it up the ass. I don't. I couldn't stay quiet. I thought it would get worse if I did. What, you don't got no balls? Wayne jeered. Oi, Jay, I think he a puffter. You say he always like this. Mate, everyone knows. All the lads and that. Swear they've seen him checking him out and shit in changing rooms. My heart was pounding. I looked up at Darren, but his eyes were set straight ahead. Tonight he was different. Blood then shot into my scalp. It was burning, and my head was yanked back towards the black daggers of branches. I yelled out, He a squealer, ain't he? Wayne's fingers clutched tighter on my short hair. Get off! I tried not to whine, throwing my arms up over my head. George's face appeared in front of me. I could see the bones of his jaw under his skin, the dull scalpel of silver in his eyes. You know what we do with fag boys, don't you? I gripped a scream. I'm not, as Wayne yanked harder on my scalp. Jord flashed a dark grin, reaching down to his thigh. Shadows laid thickly over his bruised knuckles, yet what he lifted from his pocket was the sharper silver than the moon. Chapter two. Just as my breath ruined in my throat, Wayne roared, hey, look who we got here. My head jolted forward as he let go of me. A few metres ahead, a lamppost lit a dull circle across the path. And there you stood. You buckled and turned back down the path away from us. Wayne shouted. You shifted into a sprint, but it wasn't fast enough. Darren grabbed one of your arms. Wayne locked his hands round your shoulders and dragged you off the path. You were pushed against a tree the trunk blocking out the light of the lampposts. 
Jord pulled up his balaclava to cover the bottom half of his face. Empty your pockets. I could barely make out your features. You were skinny, had dark skin, and were the same height as me. Maybe the same age, too. You did as you were instructed. Your hands shaking under the ribbons of moonlight that tore across your skin. A phone, a wallet, a couple scraps of receipts. Wayne grabbed the wallet and looked inside. Where's your money? Now in here, you fucking playing. You empty your pockets. He snatched the phone from your hand. You crossed a look with me. My eyes shot down. Terror spilled oh, across nice. my neck. Yet I couldn't help but feel a sick sense of relief that the attention was on you now and not me. No, that, but that was only until Wayne said, Eh, the fuck you got a phone like this for? I glanced up, saw your phone case was decorated in flowers. Look at him, George shouted. He sounded thrilled for a moment, before that thrill pierced into contempt, loud and hideous. Look what you're wearing. My eyes had adjusted to the dark. I made out what George meant. Blue trousers, an embroidered, an embroidered jacket, a small rainbow badge on the cuff of the sleeve, bleak in the darkness. Thank you so much, Nathaniel. I, I don't know about the rest of you, but, but it's such a tense extract and I'm so anxious about what's going to happen next that you'll have to get in touch with Nathaniel to find out. So, uh, yeah, I encourage you to do that. Um, moving away from the cold, we're going to go to the heat of Khartoum next. We're joining Rosalind Yard as she reads from her novel, The Minaret Boy. So please welcome Rosalind. And don't forget to keep yourselves on mute, everyone, please. Okay, uh, here's Rosalind now. Thank you. Khartoum, Friday's 4th August, 2006, 4.20 p.m. Ingrid blinked away the dust that had swirled up into her eyes and now squinting, looked down at the boy below from her hiding place on the balcony. He was sitting in the dirt outside the gate as he always did, legs bent unnaturally under his torso. His head was cocked, staring straight up at the minaret, shooting skyward over the high walls of the mosque compound next door. He was in her dream again last night, and this time his legs were whole, straight. She raised the cigarette to her lips, pinched between middle finger and thumb, and during her breath with a long scooping sound, like a spliff, breathing in memories of her past life with Kareem. Coughing, she let the cigarette fall, halfway done. She ground it into the beige veil of sand filming the ceramic floor tiles. An insect buzzed around her ear. She blinked again and peered over the rail. The boy was still there down below separated by the fortress black and gold bars of fencing enclosing her landlady's residence, a monstrous folly of Greek columns, foam marble and chandeliers, its grandeur set off by a deep green lawn that jarred with the sand of its desert city surroundings. Just meters away to the left sprawled a web of plastic and cardboard sheeting, one of the city's myriad squatter settlements home to the long-time war exiles from the south. A high-pitched screech broke through her, her thoughts. Imshi! Ingrid looked down again, gaze scanning in the direction of the noise. Mrs. Abdul Majid, a flash of purple and orange fabric, was lumbering towards the boy, arms flailing above her head. Water droplets from the sprinkler lurched across the path, brushing her lightly as she bundled past. Leaning further over the rail, Ingrid saw the boy turn his head towards the open gate, then up at her on the balcony. She willed him to move, calling out at the same time, Mrs. Abdul Majid. But her landlady had almost reached the boy. Only then did he break from his paralysis, trying to stand and move away, but his useless legs failed. She was getting closer. He tried to swing his body round but lost his balance and thudded sideways into the food debris littering the hard ground. 
A group of squatter children appeared from nowhere, edging forward and watching as Mrs. Abdul Majid shouted again, Imshi, I told you before to get away from my gate. From somewhere inside the folds of cloth, Mrs. Abdul Majid pulled out a stick, cutting the hot air in exaggerated zigzags as she whipped him across the body, his frame jumping in painful bursts. Ingrid moved before she had time to think, taking the steps of the outside staircase two at a time, propelled by the shrieks of her landlady. I warned you, didn't I? Don't say I didn't warn you. She reached the bottom in time to see Mrs. Abdul Majid strike the boy again, this time on the thin arm jutting out from the sleeve of his oversized T-shirt, a faded Manchester United emblazoned cast off. Slapping him once more across the head with her free hand, Mrs. Abdul Majid spat out an incomprehensible quick fire jabber. Ingrid pushed her way in between the woman and the boy whimpering on the ground. Stop it, stop it! In reaching for the stick, she felt Mrs. Abdul Majid's voluminous flesh press against her. The woman was breathing heavily now and staring right at her, her scarf darkened with sweat and pasted to her forehead. Up this close, Ingrid could smell the sourness of her landlady's breath. She winced, but pressed back into her chest. Enough, leave him alone. Is bad boy, Mrs. Adel Majid smiled, suddenly calm, reverting to pigeon English. Lipstick smudged one of her yellow front teeth. He's just a child, Ingrid threw back. Is bad boy, Mrs. Adel Majid repeated. But I know you, Hawajas, you foreigners, even black like you, all sleep with your dogs. She spat out a globule of saliva into the sand and sighed, adjusted her scarf, and brushing past Ingrid, waddled towards the gate. Ingrid reached down to touch the boy, then abruptly pulled away as his, as his hands fisted and shot up to protect his head. It's okay, it's okay, she murmured, stepping back. The boy slowly uncurled his body. His left side was caked with sand and bits of food waste. The exposed brown of his legs and arms revealed reddish streaks. Something shuddered inside her. Ingrid reached out to him again, but turning away at her touch, the boy hauled up his chest, then his legs, and limped in his awkward swinging gait towards the wall of the mosque compound. Come on, Ingrid, it'll be all right, she told herself, stepping inside the gate and heading for the stairs. Inshallah, God willing. The door to her apartment was wide open. Through the combined drone of the air cooler and the whirring overhead fan, she heard her mobile ringing, a synthesized version of El Toreador's song from Carmen, which she had downloaded in England as a joke. Before everything. Her stomach flipped. Maybe it was Kareem. Hello? A click and the line died. Her palm, still wrapped around her mobile, pulsed, then unfurled as the phone rang again. Hello? A bleep. A click. Then nothing. Who the hell is this? Another beep. Dead air. The now familiar longing rippled through her. Where the hell are you, Kareem? She reached for a cigarette from the pack she had earlier flung on the sofa and with her other hand picked up the phone, scrolling through his last text. Ing, sorry didn't contact you before, just need to be home where I belong. Sorry, K. Ingrid crushed the cigarette in her fist. Nice thought, Kareem, she muttered. Well, I'm here now, home, your home, and you've no idea what it was like waiting, making excuses, having to tell dad that his money was gone. Oh, thank you so much, Rosalind. Um, yeah, Kareem, uh, the, the visceral moment with the landlady and that bit of lipstick on her yellowed tooth. I mean, you know, it really puts you right in there. Um, and you read that beautifully. Thank you so much. And it's kind of amazing to believe we're about to have our last reading uh and aren't they also wonderfully different and fantastic uh so yes uh without further ado let's just move on 
we're going to move from one hot and tense environment to another now as we head to Arizona and the world of Joe Urell and his novel Ashland. So please welcome Joe. The pickup was nose deep in the ditch, its rusty shell matching the dirt. Nash breathed diesel, the engine still running. She climbed down, past angry taillights, gravel shifting under her feet. Her palms were clammy and she struggled with the gloves, rubber squeaking as she edged them over her hands until they snapped against her wrists. Blue bottles headbutted the windshield. Inside, the dash was speckled red and a figure was hunched over the steering wheel. There was no need to check for a pulse. The bullet had scalped him to the eyebrows. Nash rested an elbow on the roof, burning her skin. Arizona only had two seasons, hot and hotter. Someday she'd up and leave for a place with all four, where she could fish on the lake in the summer and watch the neighbourhood kids skate on it come winter. Bullet was high calibre, she said to Deputy Stark, watching from above. She poked the hole in the windshield with her finger. Maybe 0 .308. Nash looked over her aviators beyond the endless plain, wild and wind smoothed with scars scattered across its belly towards the hills in the distance. There was no way, not unless Annie Oakley herself was up there. She turned off the ignition and the car slowly stopped revving. That's when the other sounds came through. The flies pushing past her to feast, the whore collaring as it circled above, the boy quietly sobbing, curled up in the footwell of the passenger seat. The boy squirmed as the paramedic examined him. The ambulance had been five minutes behind them and Stark spent four of them bitching after she made him fetch his soda for the child. It had been sweating in the cruiser, cowboy cold. He wouldn't say a word to either of them, only opening his mouth to plug it down after she'd powered out of the ditch with him in her arms. He looked around four or five, too young to fully grasp the horror of what had happened, old enough to remember this day when he was. Can you believe it, she said. The dead body wouldn't stay with her nearly as long as the fear in the boy's eyes as the paramedic had shone a flashlight in them. I know, didn't even offer me a sip. Stark was not her choice of deputy. He was Sheriff Galloway's son, giving her no choice at all. Think he saw? He made a gun with his thumb and index finger and mimed it going off against his head, his floppy hair bouncing back and forth. Maybe he was playing Game Boy or something. They hadn't searched the vehicle yet, but the pickup was an F-100, nearly older than her, let alone Stark, and the boy's Power Rangers tee was oversized and reeked of mothball thrift. That wasn't the only thing they smelled of. His pants damp as she'd carried him, his heart beating in his chest like a canary's wings against the bars of a cage. The only entertainment this family could afford was the view from the window that had shattered along with the boy's world. The paramedic would be the first of many here. There would be state, then federal, news crews before or after, depending on how quickly they caught the scent. There hadn't been a murder in Ashland, Harlow County for 30 years, but this was something else. This was an assassination. The paramedic made them keep their distance while he examined the boy, but Nash needed to know whether he was still in danger, whether the shooter was still close by. This is bullshit, she said, going over. He met them halfway, leaving the boy in the back of the ambulance, shivering with a blanket over his shoulders when the mercury was north of 90. Shock. The paramedic's stomach was so large that his shirt untucked itself as he dabbed the sweat from his forehead with a sandpaper grade napkin that only came with truck stop tacos. Don't worry, he said, shaking Stark's hand. The blood on the boy isn't his. That's great, Nash said, but I'm the chief of police here. Panic radiated from the paramedic like the heat that came off the road in waves. Nash let him squirm, the silence between them as hot and heavy as the air that they breathed. Um, sorry, he said, but it's remarkable, really. There's barely a mark on him. Not on the outside, Nash thought. Has he said anything, she said. Not a word, the paramedic said. The boy had dark features, the opposite of Nash. The Irish in her meant that she always wore sunscreen, extra deodorant over the top so that she didn't smell like she was on vacation. If she ever took one, it would be somewhere she could do without both. But the victim's hair, what was left of it around the sides, 
was white blonde, same colour as hers when she was little, and her father would make her wear his Denver Bears cap whenever the sun so much as lurked behind a cloud. The paramedic's stomach rumbled so, lo so loudly that he put a hand over it. She didn't miss shift work, the antisocial hours, eating off greaseproof paper, but Nash's gut was telling her something too, so she pushed past him to the boy. The man in the car, she said. The boy's eyes moved from the badge on her chest to her mouth as she switched to heavily accented Spanish. No es tu padre, he shook his head. Did you see what happened? Is there anybody else here? He shook his head again. What's your name? George, he whispered, through lips as cracked as the dirt. I can't hurt you anymore, George. She took his tiny hand, swallowing it in her own. Esther Terminado. Oh, thank you very much, Joe. It's a... Uh fantastic extract and um yeah I was gonna make some terrible joke about how that terminated the evening but that totally cheapens the beauty of that reading so um yeah thank you so much for that uh what an amazing night and a great way to end uh an evening of really really wonderful different varied writers with some really interesting voices I don't know about you but I just was gripped and moved by each one in a different way and I really hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have uh, and really what remains for me to do now is just to sit, remind you that you can see all of the details in the chat of the authors but also tomorrow you'll be sent the anthologies those of you who um, uh, are the agents and so on will be sent the anthology so you'll be able to see the contact details there again but also you can always contact Emily if you suddenly decide, oh, I must have that email address, you can get it straight away. Just email her. Uh, and thank you all so much for listening and cheering everybody on in the chat. And um, aren't these the voices of the future? I feel they are. Thank you again to Emily for running this wonderful prize, to Deepa and Apara for choosing these brilliant writers, uh, and to Aidan Walker and our partners at Legend Press, particularly Lauren Wolf-Jones for all their work behind the scenes. Thank you also to the writers for reading so beautifully this evening and taking us into your worlds. And uh, yeah, just we can't wait, wait to read more. I'm going to turn off the recording now, but thank you again to everybody.